you to uh, Jeanette for the blessing of the animal service last yesterday, her and, and Kay DeMint and all those who brought their dogs and, and, uh, and there were some big dogs there, by the way. You know, that's not my thing, but there, you, <laughs> there were some big dogs there. But anyway, we are so glad that you're here. Uh, also, the board member on duty today is uh, James, our clerk, James Roberts. And uh, staff member on duty is Deacon Tim Key. If you have any questions in these, please see one of them. They'll be glad to help you in any way they can. Birthdays this week. Um, Diane Beese's birthday is on the 13th. Carol Dawkins' birthday is the 14th. Corey Stockdale's is the 14th. Janet Woods is the 14th. And Stephen Thompson's birthday is the 15th. Let's wish them all happy birthday. We want to thank uh, Tammy and Jennifer for our great Wednesday night dinner this past Wednesday night. If you weren't there, you missed a great meal. And so we also want to thank uh, Ron Prescott, Frank Dodd, Jonathan Quinn, Jim Ball, and Todd Field for the wonderful meal, the three wonderful meals that they prepared for the Alabama Tennessee Association. We got great feedback. They loved y'all's food. We thank you for stepping up and taking care of that. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. If you love the Lord, say amen. amen. If you love the Lord, say amen. amen. If you really love the Lord, let's stand on our feet and let's worship this morning. God said he would turn it around. But we have to turn it around. Turn it around. Well, God says he would turn it around. something that I don't know about you. We seem to be in a season where if I hear one more case of cancer, I just may run off the, you know, uh, and we have people who have been battling all kinds of illnesses and things, but I believe that God is a turnaround God. I believe that God is able to touch us. Uh, I love the scripture reading this morning. It's one of my favorite in the whole Bible. And some of you may be going through some difficulties this morning, but I come to tell you in the presence of Jehovah, God can touch your situation. Troubles will vanish. Hearts will become mended. 
in the presence of the King. Let's sing this one. Pray with me, please. Dear God, as we stand in your presence this morning and feel your abundant blessing and mercy, we ask that you would continue to be with us as we go forward in this service, showering us with your love, your peace, and your understanding. It is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. And of the service, we'd like to remind you that no matter who you are, where you're on life's journey, or even who you love, you're welcome here. And that's because we're the people of God who live as the people of hope. Therefore, let's declare it so this morning in our covenant affirmation. I am a child of God. I celebrate God's Holy Spirit coming into my life. Come, Holy Spirit, come. I accept God's Spirit and power to inspire me, guide me, and motivate me to be a witness of the gospel, offering hope, showing faithfulness, and sharing joy. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Before you see it, would you turn to someone near you and welcome them to the service? <laughs> What the devil meant for evil, God will make it good. Just turn it around. Oh, God Yes, my God says, He will turn it around. What the devil meant for evil. God will make it good. Turn it around. 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 it around. Turn it around. it it around. it Amen, amen. It's that time of the service where we pause to remember others that are going through difficulties, who've asked for the prayers and the of the people. And so we come to worship. We come at this time to turn our eyes upon Jesus and to look full in his wonderful face.
This is our prayer book, kept on the pedestal outside the Friends of Dorothy Welcome Center as you come in the front doors of the church. In it are recorded the prayer requests and the praise reports of our people. On Wednesday night, there's a group of us that meet in the pastor's study for upper room prayer. And by that time, one of our prayer ministers, Jamie or Judy, will have put them all of these prayers on a list. And not just these, but those that come in by the internet or email, word of mouth, however we get them. And we pause to lift each one of them before the throne of grace. But we don't just leave them there. We take them with us. And we pray over them the rest of the week. Perhaps you didn't have an opportunity to make your prayer request known. Maybe yours is deeply personal. But you'd like for us to remember it this morning as an unspoken prayer. Would you so signify by the raising of your hand? Amen. William, would you come down here, please? Um, William had to put his father in hospice yesterday. And so we know that what that's like. And the mom, come on and stand with your baby. Mama Dorothy, come on and stand with your baby. This is Mama Dorothy's old knucklehead son. <laughs> and so we just want to anoint you on behalf of your father and, and what you face and as you go through that anoint you, my brother, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If you feel comfortable, would you just reach forward to William and Mama Dorothy? Father, we come to you right now and we ask for your grace and your mercy that William's father in the sunset of life is as he prepares. Let William be prepared as well, Lord. Allow, he's been a good son. <laughs> and God, he has been attentive and he's been loving and he's done all these things that he could. And God, we place them in your hands. And so God, give him peace. Give him comfort and give him rest as he goes through these difficult times. And God, we ask that you would be with Mama Dorothy as she stands in the gap for William. And God, we just lift them up right now as a symbol of all those requests that we've already had come in and those unspoken requests. And God, I just pray that your anointing will be with them. God, these who have raised their hand, these who have submitted their prayer requests, we know that you already knew about them before they ever came in. But God, it's our way of acknowledging that you're able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask a thing. And so God, I'm asking that for all those requests that have been made, and on behalf of we, am Lord, that we'll be able to turn our eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and God, we ask that you would be with the people of this congregation. We ask that you would be with the concerns, Lord. We ask that you would touch. We pray for the leaders of this world, Lord, that they somehow will get the message of peace. And God, we pray for your church, that your name may be glorified in the lives of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's worship this morning. Please rise in spirit and stand as you're able for the reading of God's Word, which is from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. 
Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. To bow down, you all together lovely and wonderful to me. Amen. Thank you, choir. Give him another hand. Most likely, if I have ever visited you in the hospital, or maybe visited you at home after you, while you were sick or recovering from surgery or something like that, you probably have heard me use the last couple of verses that was read this morning from the, from the epistle reading from Hebrews. I probably shared it a little bit differently, slight different words than uh, was read this morning. But it's some of my favorite scripture as a pastor when I go to visit someone. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, but one who in every way has been tested as we are, tempted as we are, some translations say, yet without sin. Therefore, let us come before the throne of grace with boldness so that we may find grace and mercy to help in our time of need. That is a great passage that has spoke to my heart as a pastor. It is a scripture that I've shared uh, numerous times. I can't even remember how many times. And today I want to take a moment for us to look at those scriptures. Maybe they'll help us grow in our trust in God. And maybe... It will help us to learn what it really means praying in boldness and faith. Some of us approach the throne of God very timid. It's almost like we're afraid of God. And I understand that because you know, most churches don't scare the hell out of us. Amen? And so we approach God with this tentativeness as if something God is someone to be feared. And yet the writer of Hebrews this morning said, Let's come boldly before the throne of grace so that we may find mercy and help in our time of need. Let's pray. God, we thank you this morning for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. God, I pray right now that I might take these very favorite scriptures of mine and share with these, your children, how to approach the throne of God with grace and why we need to approach with boldness. For we pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen and Amen. Over the years when I've used that scripture, and I've used it so many times, every now and then I, when I use it, I look at somebody and you can see it in their eye. They are given this sort of mental pause when I get to that term, high priest, because they don't understand it. And, uh, you know, people from liturgical backgrounds get it immediately, but most of us are from, uh, you know, no liturgy, no liturgy backgrounds, you know. We come from evangelical backgrounds. We don't, that term high priest don't really mean much to us, and it sort of gives us pause. What is he saying here? And so I, this, I tried in the note from Pastor J.R. this week to sort of share with you something about that term high priest. 
I think that it might help us to understand what this scripture is really saying to us and what it really means for us to know that Jesus Christ is our high priest if we go back and we understand the role and the duties of a high priest. And so I ran across uh, something that sort of uh, uh, clears it up for us. Let me read you this description of the work of a high priest in ancient times. It says, on the holiest of days, and that is the day of atonement, one man stands alone in the temple. He stands at the very heart of the temple himself. itself. He would stand in the place named the Holy of Holies. If you went back and you could see an Old Testament, I mean the, the uh, temple in Israel uh, the, that Solomon built, it wouldn't look like this. Nobody could come up here. Okay? You could come in here where there was an outer court you could come in. Then you could come in here, but you couldn't come past here. And up here would be the altar where the priest, high priest would stand. But then there would be a place back here where we call, where the choir stand. Nobody goes back there except the high priest. And he could only go back there one day of the year. There was this huge curtain that hung there. Some of you may be familiar with that from uh, when, you know, Jesus was crucified on the cross and the veil was ripped in half. That's the veil that was ripped in half. That one that was behind there. And behind there was the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was called the Holy of Holies. That was where God dwelt in the temple. And only the priest could go back there. And he could only go back there one time a year. And when he went back there, he would take some blood and he would sprinkle it as as an offering of a sacrifice. And they had a scapegoat that he would bring out and take it out and release it out into the desert. And that goat, scapegoat, was to take the sins of the people and the nation away. And then it was put on his shoulders to bring a word of hope. And what was so significant about this was, it says, it is the holiest of days because after that ritual, the people would begin a new life, a new hope, and a new promise from God. That was the duties of the high priest. And so... The writer of Hebrews, with this background, is saying to the people, and I said in the note from Pastor J.R. this week, you have to understand that this letter, Hebrews, this epistle, was written to Jewish Christians who were having some trouble trying to connect their Jewish heritage and their Christian heritage together. Sort of like you and me. Having some trouble trying to connect who we are and who God says we are together. A lot of us have trouble with that. And so it's to that background that this uh, writer is saying, since then, we have this great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. What is our confession? Our confession is that we believe in this God. Amen? And we believe that, we believe in the incarnation. You know, that means the word becoming flesh. Jesus dwelt among us. We believe in his suffering. That means he went through the same things that we went through. That's what the scripture was saying this morning. We believe in his death and his resurrection. And we believe in his ascension and we believe in him coming again. And that's our confession of faith. I was in a conference in Calgary, Alberta, Canada in July of 2005. And I was in this workshop, and this nut, I mean this preacher, <laughs> was leading this workshop. And this fool, I mean this preacher said, you know, I don't really believe in a virgin birth. I don't really believe in, you know, Jesus suffering. I don't be- really believe in a literal death on the cross and a literal resurrection. I don't liter- believe in a literal ascension either, nor do I believe in a literal coming back again. 
And I couldn't, you know me, I'm real shy and timid. <laughs> I just couldn't contain myself. And here's this group room full of people. I stood up and I said, you know what? Out of turn, of course. <laughs> I said, you just named all the reasons why I call myself a Christian. Why do you? And I walked out. <laughs> because my confession is about that. And the reason why is because I love the fact that we have a God who knows what we go through. I love the fact that we have a God who's been through. We have a high priest who's been through it. And so he knows what we're going through. Amen? And I have, I, I love the fact that while the priest, the high priest back in the Old Testament, one, one day through the year, I've got a high priest who is continually before the throne of God that I can go to day or night, I can call out to when I need him. Amen? And so it's important for us to remember that Jesus is our high priest. He's not just one who one day a year show up. But he's there every day. Every day. I love the fact that this Jesus doesn't have to do any sacrifices behind a curtain. He is the sacrifice. And that sacrifice wasn't just to cover your sin. That sacrifice was to show you the depth of God's love. How far God would go to love you. And if God would go that far to love you, then God knows what you're going through. And God wants to speak to you in your need. That's the God that we're talking about. The good news is Jesus, who is our high priest, knows what our frailties are. He knows what my needs are. He knows what my hopes are. He knows what your desires are. And so this, this Hebrew writer urges us to turn to this high priest in prayer. Did you hear the praise course this morning? That writer of that praise course urges the same thing. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full. Don't look to the side. You don't have to be intimidated by the presence of God. You don't have to sneak up on him. Look full in his wonderful face. Because that's where mercy is. That's where grace is. And then the things of this earth will begin to grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. You know, the early priest could only stand there one day a year. Our high priest stands there continuously interceding for you and me. And he's pleading the, the case of grace. He's pleading the case of mercy. Aren't you glad about that one? And then he's given us the words of hope. Offering us new life that can only be found in him. Jesus is this high priest. That we're told to entrust our prayers to. Why are we told that? Because we need to find boldness in our faith. I cannot tell you how many people I talk to almost afraid to talk to God. I don't get that one. I'm glad I wasn't raised that way. I was raised in Pentecostal church. Them folks believe you can just talk to God any time. My mama, and you have to realize she was Pentecostal. That girl would walk down the street talking to the God. And if God started talking back, she'd start shouting on the street. Now, I know that would scare the daylights out of some of y'all, but she didn't care. She had a boldness about her faith. And a boldness, she didn't care who you were. If she needed time to with the Lord, she'd call on God. And she trusted. There's a clip on YouTube, YouTube I've shared with... Um, some of you in, in the church, it's a Church of God in Christ a, a clip. It's about pioneers of the faith. Uh, uh, and it's all old women over 80. And uh, I've shared it with some of you. That's one of my favorite clips I've, I've ever ran into. Because these are these old, old saints who paid a price. Who stood the test of time. You know their faith is real. I mean, this thing ain't a Johnny come lately for this. This is a real thing. And there's this, this 88 year old woman, and she said, I'm, I, I think she said something like, I've been saved 75 years, and I'm still glad. Of it. And then she starts dancing. 
<laughs> 88 years old. And it's wonderful. And I love that because it's a, it shows a boldness of faith. And you don't have to dance, you don't have to do all of that, but you need a boldness in your faith. Do you really believe God wants to speak to you? Do you really believe that God wants to answer your prayer? You know, son, I, you know, if I went up to my dad and daddy, could you give me five dollars? I need five. He'd look at me like I was a fool. I didn't, I didn't approach my daddy like that. I said, daddy, I need money. I didn't think about where he was going to get it. I knew that was where to go get it. That's the kind. Of, now, I'm not saying God is a, you know, a shopkeeper, you know. You go pick up the... But God wants to speak to the need in your life. That's what I'm trying to tell you. And you have a high priest who's been through the things that you're going through. And you need to put aside these tentative prayers. And you need to call upon God with confidence that I am a child of God. I have every right to walk right up to the throne of God and say, Daddy, Mama, this is what's going on. I need some help here. Amen? Approach the throne of grace with boldness. Pray with a boldness in your faith that God has promised to give you grace and help in your time of need. He did not promise. My mom and daddy never gave me everything I want. Let's get that straight. But they gave me what I needed. They knew better than I did what I needed. That's the kind of God we serve. And we need to approach that throne of grace knowing that this God knows what we need. Now, it may, he may not give me everything I want. But his promise is he'll give me what I need. The preacher of Hebrews is telling us we're not to pray like somebody asking a permission to do something. He said pray with the kind of confidence that children have. When they cry out to that parent in the middle of the night. Have you ever had a, cry, a child cry out in the middle of the night? They just believe a loving parent is going to come to them. It's going to meet and comfort them. Amen? And so the author of Hebrews, he's not using this fourth chapter. It's not a manual prayer, okay? It's not a, 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 a how-to easy guide for successful prayer life. No, as a matter of fact, he said... Prayer is not a matter of technique. You don't have to have a technique. Okay? He said, prayer is an expression of your trust in God. Doesn't matter how you do it. You know, I, I like the way Mama used to do it. <laughs> I grew up with that. But if yours is quiet and reverent, okay. But do it with confidence. Do it believing that you are are a child of the living God, and that God cares about you. And that God is willing to speak to you. Now, I have to say this. I sort of said it earlier. I need to say this. This does not mean that we should pray as if we're ordering clothes from a catalog. Or online. I want one of these, God, and I want one of that. That's not what we're talking about. Confident that God is some kind of clerk in a warehouse somewhere. That's not the kind of prayer we're talking about. The prayer we're talking about is trusting in faith. Believing in hope that when we pray, we, we are standing before the God who made us, the God who knows us. And that that God actually loves us. That that God is concerned about us. That that God has sent His Son Jesus and He's experienced everything you go through. There is, did you notice what that passage said? For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. That's just a simple way of saying that this God knows what you're going through. You ain't going through nothing that he's not familiar with. Because he's been through it, he's able to sympathize with you, empathize with you. And he says, if you will 
allow this God to really be a part of your life, you'll see some differences in your life. I cannot stand here and promise you're going to get everything you want. You're not. Because you and I know that everything we want ain't necessarily good for us. Every parent knows that, don't they? Everything that child wants ain't good for them. You don't give them everything they want because everything they want ain't good for them. And they can't handle it either. You know, I, I, you know, how many of you have prayed to hit the lottery? Don't raise your hand. How are you going to handle a hundred million dollars when you can't handle a hundred dollars? Why would he trust you with a hundred million when you can't handle a hundred? Amen? And some of you would never think of God again if you got a hundred million. Oops. He did go there, didn't he? Many centuries ago, that high priest went behind that curtain. One day out of the year. And he approached God on behalf of the people. And he would take their offerings. He would take their prayers. He would take the sign of their repentance with them. He would take their cares and their needs and their wants behind that curtain. And he would offer them up to God. But today, Jesus, our high priest, who has passed through the heavens, continuously do that for us, nonstop. That means that whatever you face with this morning, Jesus already knows about it. That means all the stuff that's been weighing you down this week, he is very aware of it. He, he knows that pain. That you're going through. Maybe it's a physical way. Maybe it's an emotional pain. But he knows what it is. That hurt that you can't shake. He knows all about it. And he wants you to know this morning that. He's carrying it before the throne of grace. And mercy. And he wants to speak to your distress. He wants to speak to your pain. He wants to speak to your illnesses. He wants to speak to your hunger for justice. He wants to speak to your cry for peace. Whatever it is you need this morning, he wants to speak to it. And so the writer says, open your ears and listen. Start by praying with boldness and in faith. For since we have a high priest... Who has passed through the heavens. Jesus the son of God. Let us hold on. To our confession. Therefore let us come boldly. Before the throne of grace. That we might find grace. And mercy. And help. In our time of need. When I was working on the sermon this week. I, I was sitting at the. Computer in my office. And. And. and uh, and tears began to come down my face, and I was just sitting there, and uh, I couldn't figure out. I'm working on something. Why are these tears? And then the old song came into my heart that we grew up with, and I just began to. I just pushed back from the computer, and I just began to sing it. I just began to sing it over and over again. It was a song about, and and I think the th reason the song touched me so much was. I, I went back in my childhood and I, I could see Grandma Lula and I could see Grandma Nan and I could see uh, my mama and, and so many of those sisters and things singing this song. And, and I remembered how they sang it with such great trust. They believed it when they sung it. And I just sang it. I will trust in the Lord until I die. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. This morning, I just wanted us to sing this song from my background, from my history. This is a song that helps me come boldly before the throne of grace. I will trust in the Lord till I die. Trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord till I In the Lord. 
gonna say on my bended knee. I'm going to say on my bended knee. I'm going to say on my bended knee. I'm going to say on my bended knee. Till I die. Trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. In the Lord till I die. to say amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Uh, if you're a visitor, this is a good time to fill out your visitor card and put that into the plate as it comes around. Uh, if you have not signed the sign-in tablet, that would be also a good time. Um, this morning, I am going to, as always, ask for your money and your tithes and offerings. But um, this is my last offertory um, stance right now for the board as the elections are coming up next, next week. And I'm encouraging all of the members of the church to be here. We have to have a quorum. We do need to reelect new board members and uh, delegates. And we can't do that without you and to encourage you to be here next week. We have some great candidates running. Um, I, I have great trust and faith in those that have stepped up to the plate, so to speak. So, uh, again, I encourage you to come next week and be a part of that. Your tithes and offerings help this church immensely in all its outreach and everything it does. So please give generously. You will be blessed in return. Will the ushers please come forward? As we prepare for communion this morning, let's take a moment to individually 
confess to God all the things that we may need to give up. Those things that have come between us and God, us and others, or to our own selves. Take that time of personal confession. And now let us join together and pray in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God's forgiveness empowers us in praying in boldness and faith. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, know that God has heard your confession, and you are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. You know... We don't know if we're given tomorrow. We're given today. We don't have to wait once a year to come for this altar. Because Christ is our high priest and he is there continuously with us. Yet he knew some 2,000 years ago that we need to be reminded that he is there with us. Continuously. So the night that he was in the upper room with his disciples and his friends, he took the bread, he lifted it to heaven and he broke it. And he said, take and eat, for this is my body that has been broken for each and every one of you. At the end of the meal, he took the cup of Elijah, lifted it to heaven, he gave thanks and he blessed it. And he said, take and drink all of you. For this is the blood of the new and everlasting covenant poured out for the one and for the many. Each time that you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do so to recall me into your life. If you feel so comfortable, please stretch your hand, forward your hands as we collectively consecrate these items. Dear God, we thank you. We thank you that you are truly our high priest and you're there for us continuously. We go boldly before this throne. And we ask now that you would allow the Holy Spirit to send upon the seed of the field and the fruit of the vine. So that they would truly become for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ. In whose name we do pray. Amen. Here at Covenant we hold open communion. And we're so happy to be able to say that. That you don't have to be a member of this church or of any church. Because this table was set for you. All we ask is that you come with an open heart. This is a time of reverence in our service. There may be someone beside of you that's meeting Christ for the first time. Or getting reacquainted with Christ for the first time in a long time. So please be mindful of those around you. There may be someone out there that needs a special one-on-one prayer. We will have intercessors directly after the service right here at the altar to pray with you. This table has been made ready. Come, taste and see how good God is as the ushers direct.
just the same. The blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood. The precious blood. Oh, the blood. The blood of Jesus. Oh, it was. Dear God, we thank you so much for this table of blessing and hope, knowing that you are truly our high priest. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Before we sing our closing song, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, many of you know Reverend J. Neely. He's preached here several times. He was my mentor uh, uh, through my ordination process. He passed on Monday. And so... Keep George, his partner of 44 years in prayer, and uh, the family as they go through uh, this time of transit. I'll be going to Atlanta on the 24th for the services. So uh, just keep uh, uh, Reverend Neely's family and George, especially his partner George, in your prayers. Amen? Our closing song is celebration. Is I've got a river of light flowing out of me. Well, I've got a river of life flowing out of me, and it makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Well, it opens prison doors, sets the captives free, and I've got a river of life flowing out of me. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. And it makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Oh, and it opens with the door, set the captives free. Well, I've got a river of life. Take it up. Well, I've got a river of life going out of me. And it makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. And it opens prison doors, set the captives free. Well, I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Amen. As you leave today. I pray that you will take with you that message that you do have a high priest and he knows everything you're going through and he invites you to come boldly before the throne of grace and receive whatever mercy and help you need in time of your need. Amen. Would you repeat after me? May the Lord wash between me and thee while we're absent one from the other. Amen. I've got a river of life going out.